our dreams, to try to work hard, to try to combine the beauties of the European treasures of art, music, literature, poetry, drama, and all the wonderful things that we have right here in this country, the Native American music, African American music, the music of the Latin American people, all the immigrant peoples like ourselves who came over here and brought some instrument or some story or some sensibility with it. And all these things that were kind of discarded in the higher circles of academe and in the higher circles of art of the 1940s and 50s, except for those people who were anthropologists that would collect something that was considered to be extinct and then put the skull of the object in the bottom of formaldehyde inside of a mausoleum of the arts. <laughs> we felt there was something that was still alive that was much more than that entombment of beauty. And then maybe what Jack used to call diamonds in the sidewalk, those things that we take for granted. And what Rauschenberg did when he had the found objects, would pick some piece out of the street that would be considered to be junk and take it literally from the gutter, put it in part of his canvas and build a whole extraordinary picture of it. What Marlon Brando did, and to remember the actor's studio when he was in Viva Zapata, and I saw Marlon Brando play marchbacks at Candida, and he was a fantastic classical actor with Catherine Cornell, I believe, in 1946. And because of his role with Stanley Kowalski, he studied how to be that kind of a person. And the actor studio became known for that. Everyone who was in the actor studio, even the Stanislavski method, became acquainted with Stella. <laughs> so we're going to get the scratch. And that was what the Stanislavski method. When Marlon went to do Viva Zapata, he spent months with the Mexican Indians trying to get everything to be as close to the truth as possible, seeing the beauty of what was there. And none of that was ever really acknowledged. In jazz, which was such a huge moment, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie were considered to be people who played the wrong notes out of tune. <laughs> and Jack Kerouac was judged shortly after the Rodney Metal success of Only Low as a speed typer from Lowell, Massachusetts, of a semi cretin functional illiterate who wrote long sentences, and didn't know how to write, and uh, was writing about things that were vulgar or uninteresting or too obvious. So the amazing thing to me is that a lot of folks in our generation were blessed or privileged to be with all these fantastic people and went through their whole lives, never even realized how lucky we were to even be part of that just by being there, whether or not we participated in it. Now, extraordinarily enough, and one of the reasons why I'm here, aside from the book, is that there's a young generation. I got married late in life. My kids are 22, 21, and 18. Their generation of people and their friends are all interested in this. They know who will go home to Creamy, to Franz Klein, and Joan Mitchell are. Not because they had to take a fine arts course and were afraid of flunking it so that they uh, learned their names. They're actually attracted to the work that they did. They don't feel, as some critics did, that Jackson Pollock was a, a drunken moron from the West who threw pan, uh, cans of paint against the wall. They actually found out that he studied and was influenced by American Indian sand painting, he was a student of Benton, was a classically trained artist who saw the beauty of what Jack called the diamonds in the sidewalk, the beautiful things that we're surrounded by that we take for granted. So before I read a little bit from the book, I just thought, the, the beautiful piano that was going to be here is someplace else. <laughs> as long as somebody's playing it, that means our society is safe. So I'll do what we always did in terms of our ways of, of surviving and, and cooking, which was to try to uh, deal with whatever the situation was and do something else instead. So I'll play some of the instruments I brought along anyway that were things that we used to do. We went to those bring your own bottle parties thrown by the painters that they had the most space and the most common sense at that time. And then people would come either with an instrument, a poem they'd written, a story, a song, a bag of potato chips or Dr. Brown's black cherry soda. And we would create our own art opening, concert, jazz, poetry reading happening combined with dancing, flirting, having a good time on an extremely low budget and enjoy Saturday night in New York City because we knew we didn't have to get up the next morning for our day job. And one of the things I did was to bring a little flute or a penny whistle with me. Uh, I just finished a flute concerto for James Galway that's going to be premiered this September and it's called Giants of the Night and the three movements are dedicated respectfully, respectively to Charlie Parker who I met in 1952 
Jack Kerouac, who I met in 1956, and Dizzy Gillespie, who I met in 1951. And each movement is kind of indicative of the styles of music that they pioneered, although every note is a normal European way to celebrate the beauty of the uh, spontaneity that was never written down. And this is uh, just a little theme and variations of the makeup on the spot, the way I probably would have 50 years ago before being thrown out of the party, uh, on a wonderful song called Amazing Grace. And this is dedicated not only to the wonderful artist who painted these beautiful pictures, which I was looking at, wandering around, which is so great to be in the room or even out on the block where we could be part of this. And since you were described as an emerging artist, I'm what they call a 71, a submerging artist. <laughs> <laughs> It's beautiful on the way down as it is on the way up. <laughs> so this is a little theme yeah. variations on Amazing Grace. Well, this is Amazing Grace. Chamber Orchestra, 
fabulous player, did it at a festival in the East just about two years ago, did an incredible job. And I'll play the theme, and then you don't have to hear this in five. And accompanying me, uh, making his second performance in the Los Angeles area, wonderful poet, musician, he teaches simultaneous languages in schools here. He speaks Portuguese, French, about five other languages as well. He's a great guy. I've known him since he was 12 years old. And he and his mom were friends of Jack Kerouac in Northport a long, long time ago. Please welcome a master of drummer, educator, bon vivant, man of that time, and so I'm about to be a grandfather again, Mr. Peter Lennox. <laughs> Similar to the bongos that we used to play in the 50s, this is a 
much older kind of drum, named the doom, the doom is the low note, the, high, the beck is the high note, so it's named after the self, the doom beck. And you learn to play the doom beck by actually singing it. Doom, doom, beck. send out a musical message. It's great to be back with Molly Barnes <laughs> <laughs> well, and Mother is. I used to perform mostly for people who were, I guess you would say, not kids, but very young, between 12 and 10. And 22, and their their exposure to music is mostly the institutionalized child abuse that our entertainment industry gives us—a bland, splat, Euro trash, violent, out of tune music played by angry people who feel exploited by their managers. And it's a whole sad period we're going through. The the beautiful part is there's an army of kids out there because I see them every time I go to a school and every time I play any place in public. Even the ones who are becoming hearing impaired and actually see somebody that enjoys what they're doing knows how to do it and invites them to participate, they're in ecstasy because the central nervous system, the very person and the basic spirituality every human being and every animal kingdom even has, even if we treated uh, our dogs the way we do our children, the SPCA would start a riot. So just something to think about. So those of us who think about it, rather than whining, complaining, being bummed out, being negative, figured out we would do with the great painter, a great friend of Molly Barnes, Franz Klein said, said to be in 1957, I was with Kerouac, Joan Mitchell, and a bunch of other people having a philosophic 2 a.m. discussion at the Cedar Tavern. He said, David, the trick of the arts in America is to learn to slide into shortstop. The <laughs> girl <laughs> said, what? He said, slide into shortstop. And I said, but you're not, you can't do this. He said, yes, you can every day. And I said, but that's against the rules. He said, not if you do it. He said, you're there. Mm -hmm. And then you stand up and say, here I am. And you go from that point. Well, it took me about 30 years to figure out what he was talking about. But with the internet and the World Wide Web that young people have, where they can bypass the monolithic structures that make almost everyone feel they're excluded from everything, instead of having to have the New York City situation, which I'm familiar with most of my life, of 10,000 people sitting around one hamburger with the internet and the World Wide Web, you can send out a phone, you can send out a digital copy, a JPG, a, a beautiful painting like this, you can have a melody, you can have a letter, you can have a conversation, and actually communicate with someone, and they can write back saying, no, I like that first part more. They can do something to make you know that you're there. And then, most important, from that point of view, of having enough energy to figure maybe you shouldn't just give up and despair, you could actually go out and meet another person and hang out with them and create your own art and your own community of artists and make your own films to document yourselves as we did with the film Hold My Daisy. I'm showing that tonight at the Knitting Factory at Midnight. There's a free show for this festival they're having where they have kids come from all across the country playing music and reciting poetry in East Town. Uh, Borders Books is sponsoring amazingly enough. They're at least encouraging and fostering people the idea that maybe they could be creative and do something themselves besides sitting in front of MTV or playing Game Boys and being depressed. That actually people in their own community can do that without being a world-famous person with their own corporation, can get out of the house and actually do something creative. And that's happening all over the country. And one of the nicest things is that the kids are receptive to that idea and relating to the stuff that we did so long ago. I think because they feel there was some kind of sincerity there and those that are still alive enjoy it and are grateful that we can be doing it. So one of the things that was a great crossover from the MTV generation into a newer way of looking at stuff is the tambourine. Because as you know in the, in the Bible, tambourine is mentioned constantly. All religious tracts always use the tambourine. And all cultures, from the gypsy culture, Brazilian, Armenian, Arabic, Jewish, everything, has tambourine as a big part of our history. But with MTV, just as they called Jack and us beatniks and put everything into a negative slot, the tambourine has been reduced 
it doesn't have a name, but basically from the visual and auditory perspective, it's <laughs> And usually, I guess one of the attorneys for the band is a friend of mine, Tambourine. I know a lot of lawyers and doctors who can play up a storm on everything. And there was a great painter's band that Molly knew, Howie Cannabis, Larry Rivers, a whole army of painters that can play up a storm. And there's doctors, orchestras, I go to prisons and play with musicians. So everybody in every profession, even in a victimized state, can play music. So there's no shortage of Tambourine players. So I always tell the kids that if they can get out the old history book and look up a place called Egypt, which is on the map there, even if it's not in the top 40, that all the people play the tambourine and the band leaders actually lead the band using the tambourine as the leading instrument on the shoulder. Hop my 